welcome to Movie Talk, our weekly show about movies, the people who create them, and the people who star in them. And our guest this week, Jay Roach, first came to our attention with his broad comedies, such as the Austin Powers movies, and Meet the Fockers. Oh, yeah! and then moved on to political satire with Recount. Who actually won this election? Who won it? And Game Change, and his newest picture, The Campaign. So, Jay, we think of you in terms of comedy. How the hell do you learn comedy? I don't know if you ever do. You, you, you're always in school about comedy, and I, I started in school with Mike Myers as my professor, really. I had, I had certainly been a fan of a lot of the same comedy that, that my friends are now, and, and you know, Monty Python, Woody Allen, and Mike Myers and I shared those interests, but when he tapped me to do that film, it, it was, it was uh, based on very little experience with it, and then I, I just, uh, wisely knew that my role was to give him the right setting, the right style, the right fellow, you know, the rest of the cast, and, so, and so I just helped him do what he does best and, and learn so from Austin him. So Austin Powers existed as a script, right? And, yes. And yeah. Mike came to you and said, I've got the script, it's hilarious, and you've got to do it? Well, I hadn't directed anything, and I, I really, I'd written, and I'd been a you know, a teacher at USC for a while, but I hadn't had a shot like that. So you don't say no, <laughs> and and really, it's funny the story because he, I was, I had gotten to know him through talking about history. He's a history buff, and we started talking about comedies. And he said, "Oh, I'm doing this film," and I read the script. I go, oh my God, this is hilarious! And then he said, "I'm looking for a director. Will you help me comb through these commercial reels? Because I want to." He wanted to work with. A, he thought he might work with a first-time director again. And so I was picking, I was looking for directors in a stack of stuff, uh, and he put me up for the job, really without telling me at first. They're coming! Hang on, I'm gonna floor it! Watch out! Move! 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 Careful, Austin! No! Watch out! Did you ever protest, I'm not a hilarious guy? <laughs> Do you... I, I think he could tell. <laughs> I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, famously funny, uh, uh, you know, in, in conversation. So but it wasn't most hard people to... people who are great at comedy aren't hilarious people, though. They're very serious people. Well, it's, it's interesting that even, even people who are really funny... Uh, like Mike and a lot of other people are, are often much more serious than people expect and I find often are the most thoughtful and philosophical people. They sort of surprise you that and way. And troubled. No, it's, a, it's a tough job being a, a, a comic because you, you can't really be sure ever that what you're doing is funny and you never know until it's too late when the audience says, you know, by not laughing that, oh yeah, you think that's funny but it's not. So it's, there's so much kind of uh, rejection and humiliation in comedy. I'm surprised, you know, people stay sane at all. It's a horrible way to make a living. It's a, I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> so you did an Austin Powers movie, and it's a big hit. And then you have to do a second one, right? There was, uh, there was yeah, a fair bit of enthusiasm. But keep in mind, it wasn't that big of a hit. It was, uh, it was a medium-sized hit, and it, but it had a video life that, that uh, right. made it sort of catch on and and then the second one took off and and then then uh, and then and then it was it was good to get to keep playing around with those characters I enjoyed doing sequels like those because you're given freedom and uh, resources that you don't often get on, on a, the first time out we didn't we, we could actually have sharks with frickin lasers attached to their heads by the time we did the third one and we couldn't on the first one so then along comes meet the Fockers and at some point do you say to yourself this is, my life is unfolding in front of me. I am expected to be a comedy here. <laughs> well, I enjoy it. I mean, I, I, I find it very hard and, and somewhat neurosis-making, you know. But I, I admit that I, I don't think there are too many better feelings than sitting in a theater 
uh, and hearing people just lose track of themselves for a little while. It's, it's really addictive and, and, and I will say hanging out with people like Mike and Ben and uh, Sasha Baron Cohen and uh, Ben Stiller, uh, you know, those guys are among the most enjoyable people to talk about with any, about anything. Uh, so it's not all bad, you know, it's just, it's stressful. <laughs> I went in and just simply, you know, just into a little saucer and uh, then took the saucer and fed it to Geppetto. That's what I named him, Geppetto. I, I, I had no idea you could milk a cat. Oh, yeah, you can milk anything with nipples. I have nipples, Greg. Could you milk me? You produced now Borat and Bruno. And mm -hmm. as the producer, how often did you say to yourself, there's no way we're going to get away with that? Well, Borat, I, I was very uh, surprised that we got away with it. I mean, it was at a major studio. Uh, it got shut down one time. You know, we had one director walk out on it. I mean, it, there were so many times when that project seemed like it was on its last legs. And when you look back at the way the film turned out and you, and you think about it being... Uh, you know, at a, a major studio uh, and what we got away with. But I think the, the guys at that studio at Fox were actually really um, wise to let Sasha push it because the pushed version was so much better than even just the little bit walked back version. And, we, and there were talks about walking certain things back, but it was, it was most potent in its fiercest form, you know, and Somehow, and, and my hat's off to those guys at Fox, uh, Giannopoulos and Rothman and Hutch Parker and all the people that we worked with there, they, they really let us do exactly what we wanted. My name is Bora. Okay, okay, good, good. Well, I'm not used to that, but that's fine. But I remember, the, the, I think it was one of the first now. screenings at the Chinese theater, and there were a lot of professional comics in the room, and yeah. you and everyone at Fox looked really anxious. And the thing played... That's my normal look, just keep that in mind. But yeah, <laughs> okay. but they were, I agree. Uh, but uh, the thing played mind-bendingly well. It's one of, one of those films, there are moments in that, in that film for the audience that I remember uh, looking back and just seeing people, you know, just losing track of their bodies and slapping each other, pulling shirts over their faces. There, uh, one screen, I've told this story before, uh, two guys ran to the screen and ran back high-fiving everybody like it was a basketball game or, so, or a tent revival. And I've never seen anything like that. No, it was a unique experience. It really was. Thank you. You're very nice for having me. <laughs> What's your name? Um, we're on air right now doing the weather. What's your name? We're on the air doing the weather right now. I'm up. Uh, go over here with Adrian. Go over here with Adrian. She's calling you to go over here. Hey, is that yes, I'm up. Uh... Well, well, nice. That's <laughs> good. good. <laughs> okay, so then you enter an entirely different phase. You reinvent yourself, and you're suddenly doing movies about real people. Yeah, I mean, it was, again, a sort of uh, accidental, amazing thing that happened. Um, people had heard that I liked that script, and, and Sidney Pollack and Paula Weinstein, uh, when, when Sidney got sick and, and couldn't proceed with with the film, they gave me a call and I, and I got to jump in and do recount. What about some partial recounts? Just a couple of counties. A couple of counties is not gonna work. No, wait a minute, Palm Beach and Volusia were the main source of problems on election day, right? right? We'd be justified in asking for recounts in those two counties. All three members of the Palm Beach canvassing board are Democrats and they'll probably agree to a hand recount. That's right. We gotta start punching, Chris. The Bush brothers are not gonna be so interested in a dignified process. Well, that may be true, but the world is watching. We are, theoretically, its last great democracy. If we cannot resolve this in a way that is worthy of the office we seek, what kind of hope do we give other countries who wish to share our values? Why would they call you? You're, you're a funny guy. Recount <laughs> was a, a serious, if not yeah. tragic, movie about how an, a major presidential election was basically stolen. Well, it's funny, Sidney Pollack and I had discussions. I'd known Sidney over the years, and he was always extremely uh, supportive. And, um, you know, I didn't talk to him enough to call him a mentor, but he, you know, I, I learned from him every single time I talked with him. And I always admired how 
one, he tells great story after great story after great story without having sort of needing to stamp some stylistic thing. He just always served the story. And two, we talked about how comedy and drama both need suspense and how you have to learn to wind the springs and, and know exactly how to time them going off and, you know, whatever the metaphor is. Uh, he, he and I had a lot of talks about how he, he does that so well, and I, I guess he thought I understood what that m script needed, and he, we talked about politics too, so he just had some instinct that, uh, that I, you know, I, might, I might be able to handle it. I say, whoever stops fighting first always loses. It's absurd. It's completely absurd. I'm in the middle of a recount where the votes aren't being recounted and nobody seems to care. Not a single person seems to care. And you know what I'd like to know? Who actually won this election? Who won it? Okay, we'll press this button here. Okay, okay. okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Press this button. Okay. Nothing, nothing. Okay, okay. okay. we go. Good, good man, good, good man. Good. Hey, no, no, Good no, man. No, no, no. Okay, no, no. we're one. Okay. 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 okay, we're set. No! Get him off me! I'll kill him. I'll kill him. Okay, board, there's, there's a bar. Uh, there's a bar. No, that's not, that's worse. That's worse. Do what? That, we, I don't need that. I don't need that. Okay. Can you stop the rocket? Okay, Marvin, any ideas? I have a million ideas. They all point to certain death. Thanks very much, Marv. Jay, you clearly are a lover of good books. Hitchhikers <laughs> came to you. Why? Weirdly enough, I had a, an interest in science fiction uh, and wrote mostly science fiction before I got to direct. I, I did have a short and, and not very uh, sparkly career as a, as a screenwriter, and a lot of it was sci-fi. And I had then done Austin Powers, and somehow Douglas Adams... Uh, I think it was through actually a, a common friend, Michael Nesmith of the Monkees, who uh, said, oh, you should meet this guy. We put us together, and we started working on an adaptation. Uh, and we, we worked on it for years, and it's, it's kind of a Monty Python f sort of feeling, but in, but in, uh, in, in a kind of sci-fi world. And, and um, I've learned that there is a, almost as much as this is true for satire, there is a prejudice against quote unquote science fiction comedies. And there, there are examples of quite a few that haven't worked, but I've often thought, and Used Guys was my sci fi comedy, that uh, the, the, the opportunity to explore ideas that science fiction gives you without the rules of contemporary civilization, uh, you get to sort of, it's almost like a parable, uh, you know, and Douglas's work was both hilarious and, and uh, so intensely thought-provoking that I, I was excited to get to work with him. Then we didn't pull it off, and then Douglas died uh, at age um, 49. It was so heartbreaking, and I, I just couldn't face doing it without him. And uh, um, so I found this great director, Garth Jennings, in England, and you know talked him into doing it, and but then the I produced it. But the picture did not find a big audience. It didn't find a big audience, uh, and so maybe in a way um, there was some some something that Disney knew. Uh, but it's a, it's still people come up to me and and mention it, and it's it's mm. one of those films it's that has movie. its own it has its own audience. Um, a very very cool series of books, and I hope someday they'll they'll find another another life in film. I'm assuming you have a better plan. Well, I kind of had this idea that we could... Ow! To get back to actors, Bobby De Niro was determined to reinvent himself as a funny guy. Yeah. Because the leading men, as they get older, they don't get the girl anymore, and, and you know, it needs some reinvention. Yeah. So he was hilarious in Meet the Fockers. Now, did you work Very with him funny. a lot with just that specific issue in mind of comedy timing? Well, I had seen him in one of my favorite comedies, um, certainly one of my favorite action comedies of all time, uh, Midnight Run. Yeah. And I was astonished how funny he was. He had very good, uh, straight, tough guy uh, persona, but he was finding the rhythm that he, that he somehow knew was funny. and. Uh, opposite Charles Grodin, they were just a fantastic duo. And I, I needed, for Ben Stiller's character, uh, a kind of manifestation of your absolute worst nightmare uh, future father-in-law to be. And that was really it. And the, the scrutiny with which De Niro can watch you 
um, I just thought it would be really funny. And so he, d you know, he did meet the parents with us, and then and then uh, I got to do meet the Fockers with him, and and also Dustin Hoffman and Barbara Streisand. Morning, partner. Morning. Sleep okay? I slept all right, thank you. It's nice all of us being here together, don't you think? Bernard, do you mind if I have some privacy? Almost done. When you stop and think about it, he gets everything wrong, uh, De Niro. Uh, he never, he's supposed to be an ex-CIA, um, and he probably was good when it came to national defense, but when it comes to ferreting out, you know, deception by his own future son-in-law, he, he always got it wrong. And I thought that was a funny, uh, a funny way to, to mess with Bob's, you know, the baggage and, and persona that De Niro brings to the right. situation. Yeah. Now, you are in the middle of controversy, and you're mm. considered a difficult person because the, the right, the political right in our country is furious at you. And my Some wife are. and I each come from the most right-wing families mm -hmm. known to man, and everyone Me in too. our families hates you. Yeah. So to, how are you handling yeah, that's, this? <laughs> uh, my family is largely conservative also, um, and... I think that's helped me because uh, I, I, I do, as you can tell, uh, enjoy trying to see the world from other points of view. And, and I try always in these films, in these serious films, to, to not get caught up in, in sort of a, uh, an agenda that's just mine. In the case of, of Game Change, we, we interviewed Everybody involved, who were, by the way, all Republicans, and some were loyal to her and remained loyal to her, and some started loyal and did not remain. But they all started loyal to her, and they were all on her side to begin with. So um, I understand uh, not wanting to air out the dirty laundry, not wanting to, to have uh, moments of, of uh, dysfunction sh repeated on screen. <laughs> but I really do... Uh, feel confident that as far as much as anyone could in a dramatized version of a movie like a story like this we we s sought the truth this is Sarah American woman! you know they say the difference between a hockey mom and a pit bull lipstick I'm not sure how much she knows about foreign policy. You can actually see Russia from land here in Alaska. Oh my God, what have we done? You're telling me what to say, what to wear, how to talk. I am not your puppet. I got emails uh, saying, you know, don't make fun of Sarah before uh, before I started, and and I was like, hey, hi, don't worry, I won't. I'm just I'm gonna show what we find out. You know, we'll we'll find that out, and then I'll. I'll tell the story, and you know we listened to her book. I tried to reach her myself. I really, really wanted to yeah. have her cooperation. We never I expected it. I can see that should be self-protective. When you interviewed her, didn't you ask her about national security, foreign policy, domestic policy? I thought Gova House would cover that. So what did you ask her? I just we talked about if she would back John's positions when they conflicted with hers or, or if she was prepared for her life to change and there were no policy questions. You guys didn't grill her because you wanted it to work. I wasn't in charge of the Fed, Nickel. Do you say to yourself, I'm going to stay with this, I like political satire, I'm going to continue doing this, or do you miss doing total balls out comedy <laughs> what what do you want to accomplish well i've got i've got such a great opportunity and the one i'm in the middle of we've finished shooting and now i'm cutting this one with will ferrell and zach galifianakis where i get to do both so i actually found a way to, to which is my favorite thing to not have to decide between the two but i i do aspire to uh, making films in a you know in a kind of range of tones i i love comedy it, as i told you it's one of my favorite things to do but i i i I'm curious, and I'm, and I am 
anxious and I worry about my kids, I worry about uh, the country. I, I just, I can't imagine that a country that began as such an idealistic experiment and succeeded and fulfilled in a way the dreams of those ideals for so many years, off and on, obviously, sometimes more successful than others, but um, it gets to a place where, where great leaders, not just good leaders, but great leaders are so hard either to recruit or to, to, it's hard to allow them to do their best so that they survive the process, but what, whatever it is that's, that's keeping the, the Abraham Lincolns and the Thomas Jeffersons, uh, you know, of now out of the process and out of, there are a few for sure, but it shouldn't seem like every party should have five or six amazing choices yeah. in those debates. Yeah, absolutely right. I don't think that's happening. So now how, <laughs> how does the campaign, your next, next picture, film. how does that elucidate this? Well, it's a film about the power of, of big money driving negative campaigns. I mean, it's two guys, an incumbent who's challenged Will, Will Ferrell's the incumbent, uh, Zach Galifianakis is the, the upstart challenger, and uh, uh, they take turns getting these huge sums of money to make ridiculous commercials that trash each other and, and, and get in these hilarious debates. Uh, and it's, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's a very big comedy. It's a summer comedy about politics, which r right away is kind of amazing that uh, Warner Brothers said, oh, that's, that sounds commercial, you know, yeah, let's, good, let's good do a big them. political comedy. I just think the ability to get people to think about things while you're also making them laugh is an enviable one. And, I, I, and Adam and Will, Adam McKay and Will Ferrell have been doing it. And, uh, and Zach turns out to be amazing at it. So, is he uh, from a political family, though? He is. His, uh, his uncle ran against, uh, I believe, Jesse Helms uh, in North Carolina. And they, his family, yeah. that, it's set in North Carolina. Because both he and Will Fowler are very bright guys. Absolutely. Who have cultivated a totally doofus persona. Well, yeah, sometimes you, you have to play dumb to say smart stuff and get away with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and did you, you worked with them, obviously, very intensely on the script. To, to uh, yeah, we all worked really hard on it. Um, but those, you know, those guys are great screenwriters, uh, Adam and Will. And uh, Chris Henchy also wrote it, and a guy named Sean Harwell. Uh, Chris is their partner. And... In um, Funny or Die, and a great writer who've, who I've worked with off and on. So it's a, it was an amazing team of writers, but we all, yeah, we all worked on the script together for a long time. It's great to talk to you, man. Thank you. Yeah, that was delight. great. Thank you. Really, really enjoyable.